It was a year ago when we focused in on school threats. We focused in on one that happened two years before the horrible Oxford school shooting. Now there is more. We also focused in on how TikTok was involved in all this by claiming a national school shooting day where everybody just posted a lot of threats and TikTok saying it's going to investigate this. Now there are psychologists who say school lockdowns could have a lasting impact on students. Take a look. El Campo High School is back open this morning. It went on lockdown for several hours yesterday. All this happened after somebody called 911 claiming to be a student with a gun. Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies said they did not find a weapon and no students were hurt. This is just the latest in a string of school lockdowns across our region. And the person accused of forcing a lockdown at Cosumnes River College last month is in custody this morning. Los Rios police say the suspect threatened violence against an employee and the college. Police have yet to release the person's name in custody. And thankfully, no one was hurt in either lockdown, but these kinds of things do take a toll on students. That yeah, can definitely be scary. ABC 10's Bridget Biorlo is joining us live from outside of Del Campo High School this morning. Bridget, how are students feeling today? Maria Walsh, thankfully no one was physically harmed, but you can tell by the look on students' faces as they were leaving campus yesterday at Del Campo High School that they were visibly shaken by the experience, the shock of sitting in lockdown for over an hour, just not knowing what was happening at their school. And keep in mind, this is not the first lockdown this semester throughout our region. So tensions and anxiety has been high, certainly, and it's left the entire student population population in Sacramento on edge. Students were hunkered down for several minutes in the dark, windows closed, police went door to door, room by room, looking for a potential active shooter. And that's because a call came into 911 with someone claiming to be in the locker room armed and telling police, quote, they are ready to kill. So police obviously have to take a threat like that seriously. That's why they came here so quickly to rule out any potential threat. They said they never found a gun. They never found an armed suspect. So they cleared the area. Students were able to leave at 3.39 when the lockdown was called off. That's after school hours, by the way. But as you mentioned, situations like these have a lasting toll on them. Some psychologists saying that they can feel the impacts of this sometimes for quite some time. Take a listen. There's police helicopters and there's sirens and all kinds of things going on. This may be extremely traumatizing for a student. We want the kids to talk about things. We want them to share their emotions, their reactions. Absolutely. What you don't want to do is say, you know, suck it up. That's just the way it is. It really is the worst nightmare for students being involved in a potential school shooting. Now, thankfully, everyone is okay, but as we mentioned, this is not the first time this has happened. This semester alone, you might remember last month, Christian Brothers had a similar threat. That was eventually ruled a hoax, but back in September, South Stockton High, they were on lockdown because they had a scare after an armed man was found not far from campus. So these incidents are happening more and more frequently, and students are feeling very unsettled, Brian. Yeah, you can truly understand the anxiety, Bridget. What support is being offered to students who may be struggling? Well, the school district recognizes, Bria, that there could be trauma after an event like this is being on lockdown, not knowing what was happening. So they called in grief counselors. We're told they'll be here all week to talk with any students feeling concerned or scared or any type of emotion. They want to work through that together. And we're also told that teachers will be addressing the situation yesterday to their classes just to open the dialogue and let everyone know that we are all in this together. Bria, Walt. Better to talk about it than leave it in. Bridget, thank you. Yeah, it's way better to leave it in than just sitting there letting it happen. But, as I've talked about, school threats are being taken very seriously. And police officers are going on social media saying, if you think you're going to post a threat, fake or real, not only are you going to be getting out of school, but you're going to jail. And, incidentally, no one's taking this very seriously. They think it's all a joke because, oh, I'm going to go post a threat. I'm going to threaten to shoot up a school because I don't want to go to school. I think what I can do you as an example 
do for you as an example. I'm going to play you an episode from a... I've seen this episode many times where he doesn't want to recite... Where everybody hates Chris, where Chris doesn't want to recite the speech that the teacher has... Has, um, uh... Told Chris to recite, recite an uh, old speech. And then Greg was all like, well, you can call it a bomb threat. It happened this and this. And so, if I would have called one of these bomb threats, I was the one who did this. Sorry. If I was the one that called in these threats, I'd be sitting in jail for the rest of my life. 20 years. Sitting in there, doing nothing. Sitting in there, doing nothing. Having three meals a day, and sitting there saying to myself, I fessed up, I knew what I did, now I gotta pay the consequences. But wouldn't it be, nice, wouldn't it be great to say, I'm sorry, I screwed up, please give me another chance. No one gave me another chance. It'll be up to the school district to decide to press charges and officers to follow the law. Still ahead, you're about to meet a group of survivors. You're going to meet a group of survivors who years ago were on an airplane. It crashed. Then the survivors had to eat each other, the ones that were dead. You're going to hear their sides of the story. But coming up next, that clip that, that, clip, that, clip that I promised you from Everybody Hates Chris, where Chris called in a bomb threat. You think I'm playing? Stay with us. I'm about to play you a clip from Everybody Hates Chris of where Greg tells a funny story about when his cousin called in a bomb threat. Take a look at this. My life is hanging by a thread. You're going to tell me a funny story? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this one time, my cousin Benny, he didn't study for a test either, right? So <laughs> he picks up the phone and he calls in a bomb threat and they cancel school. Right. Like I'm going to call in a bomb threat. Hello. I have planted a bomb at Tatalia High. Unless everybody is out of that building in the next 40 minutes, everybody will be out of that building in the next 40 minutes. In the 80s, making a bomb threat was nowhere near as easy as it is now. Sir, unless the bomb is committing a crime, there's nothing we can do. Unless the bomb is up a tree and can't get down, there's nothing we can do. Finally got the right people on the phone, but I still couldn't figure out why the school wasn't being evacuated. Ah, oh, school. 40 minutes. Okay, you have a nice day. Huh? I'm going to lunch. <laughs> Tell the bomb squad they got a message. Back home, my dad. Mojo recipes were laying eggs. Now, it may be, now, this is a show and it was funny. But if it was for real life, you'd be going to jail. J-A-I-L. Jail. Okay. Let's get to the one where this, Chris' school's on the news. Take a look at this. Emergency triage area with heart palpitations. Don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. How do you know? This whole place could blow. Metal chairs flying like shrapnel right. everywhere. I called in the bomb threat. What? Where were you to get such a crazy idea? From you, with that story about your cousin Benny. Oh. I may have exaggerated a bit. What's wrong with you? Why don't you make up a story like that? I have a penchant for hyperbole to aggrandize myself. I've been working it out with my shrink. Look, bottom line is the school is not going to blow up. They're going to send us all home for the day, and I'm going to have to recite that stupid speech. Attention, everyone. I'm Captain Tyrone Williams of the Bomb Squad. The school has been cleared, and the bomb threat is over. Thank you for your cooperation. I've never seen a black man on that side of a megaphone. We would send you all home, but with finals next week, it's best if you go back to your classes. So we'll resume with this period, and Tyrone will resume searching my office. 
office and my person. Hey, yo, mama. I'll see you back in class, huh? Maybe if I start you off, you'll remember the speech. All right, it starts like this. Called from retirement, in which I had supposed... I, I don't know the speech, and I cannot go back into that class. What are you going to do? Panic! for you to freak out after a bomb scare. It's called post-traumatic stress syndrome. But being from... Now, how did he fess up and said, I called him that bomb threat? Everything would have been all right. If he'd fessed up, everything would be okay, right? Maybe. But then he'd be spending the rest of his life in jail. And then Rochelle... <laughs> Rochelle would have been all like... Boy, I'd not go in the subspace. Then he'd be, then he'd be screaming out and out of space while in jail. Nothing gets through. That stupid black kid is there. <laughs> All right, there are now new safety concerns in El Paso PK's pre-K pre-k through eight school now all this you now throughout the years of the show we've been focusing a lot about school safety and what you can do to prevent this from happening again take a look at this play the clip then we're going to break I remember we had a Just yesterday, ABC7 reported on a lockdown at a Northeast El Paso school. El Paso ISD officials got a report of a weapon on campus, but no weapon was ever found. Now, this lockdown came as several security issues at that same school prompted parents and others with knowledge of the school to raise the alarm to ABC7. Brianna Chavez has extra depth on what's being done to make the students safer. Joe Hill Pre-K through 8 is one of El Paso ISD's new consolidated elementary and middle schools. But this brand new campus in Northeast El Paso already has a number of security issues. That's according to people connected to the school who contacted ABC7. Yeah, there's a lot of concerns from teachers, my co-workers. They feel very unsafe. Kids feel unsafe. A former EPISD employee tells ABC7 there have been multiple occurrences that he feels put students and staff in danger. The former employee of nearly four years agreed to describe what he witnessed and experienced if he could hide his identity. We'll refer to him as Steve. I remember we had a, a fire drill. We did not hear anything in the portables as far as alarms, sirens, or, or even intercom. That drill happened back in September. We have no way of what's going on as far as communication. Steve says teachers must rely on their cell phones. If we're teaching, we we'll focus on the students, not the cell phone. I asked EPISD officials about the fire drill incident. The chief operations officer, Alan Warnicke, confirmed it. The, the portable um, alarm system or the uh, PA system was not active for a short period of time. We identified that during an, uh, an alarm. I can tell you with a district this size, it's inevitable that you're going to have lapses that occur, uh, maintenance problems that occur. According to Steve and others I spoke to, another lapse at Bobby Joe Hill is in the electronic access control. The system was installed at every door throughout the campus with the swipe of a key card you're in. But Steve says the cards don't work, so key card holders still cannot get into the building. If they have kids outside, how are they going to get them inside the building if there's an active shooter outside? I spoke with several district leaders, including the chief of police, for this report. They acknowledge the key cards won't work until construction on the school is complete, which won't be until the start of the spring semester, January 4th. Everyone must enter through the main campus doors, and administrators staggered teacher schedules so when they're not teaching, they can monitor doors. You know, with the recent tragedies, we've really been focusing on incorporating uh, electronic access control at all of our exterior doors across the district. 
That focus isn't just here at Bobby Joe Hill. School officials in Texas are locking all entrances as a part of a new state directive on the heels of the Uvalde school shooting. Now, the Texas Safety School Center and the Texas Education Agency will be visiting some El Paso schools at random, making sure those doors stay locked, otherwise known as intruder detection audits. Part of the methodology through this process is we aim to reach 100% of the school districts in the state of Texas um, by the end of this year. Kathy Martinez Prather is the director of the Texas School Safety Center. She says these audits are conducted weekly. They'll focus on four different things, whether or not someone can get into the building without using the main entrance, exterior weekly door sweeps, which is a new state requirement, directives on locking and closed classroom doors during school, and how the schools conduct visitor check-in and check-out. Okay, may I see your ID? Okay, let me let you in. The goal is to have the teachers and staff normalize these measures. So the idea here is about keeping those uh, external threats out. While everyone's safety is the overall goal, Steve is hoping the basic security needs are met at Bobby Joe Hill. If we didn't learn from the incidents we've had in the past, God forbid our kids, our staff, and parents or anyone around the school will probably end up getting hurt. Brianna Chavez, ABC7. And the Texas School Safety Center could not comment on which local campuses will or have already received a visit. And it's a great thing. They can, we can learn from our mistakes. We're all human. We all make mistakes. But we can learn by our mistakes. That's why, we, that's why history is being taught, so that we can learn from the mistakes that we're repeating the mistakes. That's why I think things have got to be fixed so that this doesn't happen again. So, I'm glad that things are being, I'm glad that um, things are being kept under control. Coming up, coming up next, a story that electrified the world. You're going to meet a group of men who, whose airplane crashed. How would they survive? Keith Morrison with Alive. Stay with us. We're about to take you on a journey on an airplane. Now, this ain't just any kind of airplane. This is an airplane that the three people, three to four people you're about to meet were on as they traveled for rugby, a great game. But what happened next was to everyone and the world. Here's Keith Morrison with a Dateline Survivor story. I think that every single human being placed on that spot with those conditions would have done the same thing. And we got to the mental and physical limits of a human being and we surpassed them. They are middle-aged men now and still they cannot let it go. Could they have somehow avoided the terrible choice they made high on this Andes mountain? How must they feel coming back here after all that happened, after they shocked the whole world? This was a life and death game. Dr. Roberto Canessa. Friends were dying every day and, and death was getting closer to you and you were the next one to die. Their game, as the story begins 25 years ago, is rugby, though Montevideo, Uruguay is an unlikely place to find it. South Americans love soccer, but in warm resort like Montevideo, influential Catholic families brought over Irish Christian brothers who use brutal rugby to toughen their sons. And now, for the boys, the game is as ingrained as their Catholicism. Rugby teaches you that when they hit you, this must trigger you to go ahead, because the stronger the blow, the harder you go. There is Roberto Canessa, muscles they call him, bright, cocky, stubborn, the son of a prominent physician and himself a medical student. His good friend, Nando Parado, far quieter, but even tougher, off the field almost shy, but decisive in action. In 1972, their team, the Old Christians, is almost unbeatable. They're invited to play the South American champions in Santiago, Chile. To save money, they charter a Fairchild 227 from the Uruguayan Air Force and fill it with friends and family. 
Parado brings along his mother and sister. Also along for the ride is Coche Inciarte. Coche is older, cares nothing for rugby, but is a lover of life. And a weekend in Santiago sounds fine. To get there, they must cross the highest mountains in the Western Hemisphere, the Andes. It's October, late winter here in South America. The weather is unpredictable. At 2.15 on Friday, the 13th of October, the boys joking about bad luck. They take off on the 900-mile trip to Santiago. There are 44 passengers and crew. The pilot reaches cruising altitude, 18,000 feet, and sets a course through a pass between 22,000-foot peaks. Because of the thick cloud cover, the pilot can't tell that a headwind is slowing the plane. He believes he has cleared the Andes. At 3.35 p.m., he begins his descent to 10,000 feet. The first hint of his mistake is the turbulence. Suddenly, one of the boys asks, should the mountains be so close? We looked by the windows and uh, to our left, and I saw some dark spots very near the tip of the wind. And at the same moment, I heard the, the engines uh, getting more power from the pilot and the nose of the plane lifting up. The desperate pilots go to full power. They try to ascend. In the back, in a loud voice, someone begins to pray the Hail Mary. And then it strikes the mountains and sliding at, at a tremendous speed. And I, th I thought, well, I cannot look forward to anything. The only thing I can look forward is if God exists. The crash was dramatized in the 1985 movie, Alive. At more than 200 miles an hour, the plane slams into the mountain. It's torn apart. Three boys and two crewmen plummet to their deaths. What had been an airplane is now a runaway toboggan screaming down the mountainside. The passengers still alive brace for the impact. One boy rips off his seatbelt, grabs the ceiling, and prays. Just before the plane crashed, and I said, Jesus Christ, I want to leave. And I put all my strength in the, in the roof. The prayer ends. The fuselage slams to a halt in a snowbank. It was the definition of chaos. Coche Inciarte, just along for the ride. My friend's blood screams and people moaning. And as I tried to get up everywhere, there were people alive, people dead. The interior of the wreck is a jumble of shredded metal and horribly injured people. The two young medical students aboard quickly learn how little they know. And you look to your side and you see your friend die. And then something changes inside you. Stunned survivors wander out of the jagged hole that was the tail of the plane into the snow and sink to their waists. It is below freezing. They're dressed in short sleeve shirts and sneakers. Most of them have never seen snow before. Two struggle forward to the cockpit to radio for help. But the radio is useless. The pilot is dying. The co-pilot, his chest crushed by the instrument panel, begs for his pistol to end his own life. The shocked boys can help neither of them. That afternoon, when the plane fails to reach Santiago, there is among those waiting for it a sinking feeling of doom. A search has begun, but from the start, there is little hope. The rescue squad now knows the pilot had given an incorrect position in his last radio transmission. They will have to search thousands of square miles across an Andean range that reaches 22,000 feet. No one knows that the plane lies at 12,500 feet near a volcano on the Argentine side of the border. Night comes on the mountain. The temperature falls to 35 degrees below zero. In the freezing night, the death toll mounts. When someone suffered or screamed, the only thing we had for them was a kind word. There was nothing we could do for them. The screams, moans, and prayers of the wounded and dying reverberate through the fuselage all that first night. And when at dawn the survivors crawl out of the wreckage, only 28 are still alive, several of them grievously injured. And it dawns on them. There's practically no food. All the boys can find in the plane looks like this. A couple of bottles of wine, some liquor, eight candy bars, dried fruit, some jam, and a packet of crackers. Above them, heavy clouds have moved out of the mountain. 
A tiny transistor radio like this one has survived the crash. They can hear reports of their disappearance. It is clear the searchers have no idea where they are. And even if someone did, in the clouds they're invisible. And for all their desperate trouble, this was the worst of it. All they could see was snow and ice and mountain. All they could hear was the howling wind and the rumble of avalanche. Nothing grew here, nothing lived. They had no idea even in what country they lay. They were lost in a terrifying whiteness. Nando Parado has been unconscious since the crash. He wakes up. I can recall asking everybody there, uh, where is my mother, how is my mother, where is she? Uh, where is my sister? And they told me that uh, my mother had died on impact. And he looks over at his sister and sees that she is dying. You don't know where you are. You're completely doomed. It's cold. You're thirsty. There's no food. There's nothing. This is so tough. This is was so hard that we would have preferred not to be born. And for the rapidly dwindling number of survivors, the worst is yet to come. So now the plane crashes, but could they survive when we come back? More about the heroic tale of the boys and the plane crash. Stay with us. 28 survivors out of the 46 that, that survived. Now remember, the plane crashed near a volcano. And a lot and um and a little supply, little supplies were there. Wine, chocolate crackers, and the temperature falls to dangerous levels. But could they survive? Once again, here's Keith Morrison. As the survivors drag first themselves and then their dead from the wreckage on a brutally cold Saturday morning, they're in shock. The cold was a pain into the bones. You don't feel your hands because they are like anesthetized. They must constantly hit themselves and each other to keep their flesh from freezing. And they feel a suffocating fear. Even hope seems impossible. The mountain is shrouded in heavy cloud. They can hear airplanes, but no airplane can see them. And when the skies finally do clear, the only movement in the merciless distance is shifting snow, avalanche. It should come as no surprise that though the official search went on for more than a week, nothing was found. The crash could not have happened in a more inaccessible place. And the white painted Fairchild was half buried in what was then the heaviest snowfall in 50 years. The mountain wind howls beneath the peaks. The wind chill is 20 below. Where are they? The pilot might have offered some clue, but he had succumbed to his injuries on the first long night. The 28 survivors are obsessed with food. There is so little. Their daily ration is something like this. A cap full of wine, a tiny bit of jam, and two minute squares of chocolate. There isn't even water to drink. But through their desperation, there are flashes of inspiration. A clever engineering student puts his training to good use, fashions pieces of aluminum into small solar reflectors to melt snow and collect water. They work, but slowly. Even with careful rationing, the little food they have goes fast. They're weaker by the hour, expending incredible amounts of energy just to stay warm. There's very little in the wreckage to burn. They find a few paperback books. But the small fire makes little difference in the icy air at 12,000 feet. Hour after hour, day after day, they stare into the Andean sky, looking for a search plane. There are none. By the fourth day, many are so weak from cold and hunger, they lack the strength to crawl out of the fuselage in the mornings. The idea of dying is something that uh, compels you and, and paralyzes you. They know they're starving to death. The hunger pains are like a razor. Their bodies are shrinking, consuming themselves. And they come to a terrible revelation. There lying before them in the snow is their sole macabre hope of salvation the frozen bodies of the dead. Unspeakable thoughts come unbidden when you're starving, the kind you stifle. And it came like from different minds at the same time. 
someone said, uh, I'm, I'm crazy because I'm thinking of eating dead people. And I said, well, there is the only chance to survive. So now it's in the open, and the desperate survivors meet inside the Fairchild. Some of them are horrified. How can they do such a thing? And Canessa asks, how can they not? Tell me about the decision to uh, eat the flesh of those who had died. How do, how do you come to that kind of conclusion? For everyone, I think, was a, a different experience, and everyone handled it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I remember that someone said, well, if Jesus Christ gave his body for the humanity, um, I feel that our friends are lending us their bodies. We want um, to convince all the, all, the, all the team, you know, all the boys. We, we move like a group, so we say, okay, if you don't do it, I am not going to do it. The decision is unanimous, but not without enormous doubt. Several boys, including Koche, say they will not do it until every scrap of food is gone. But decision made. Kamesa finds a sharp piece of glass and leads a group of teammates outside and toward one of the bodies in the snow. And if he was to lead them into this particular hell, he would go all the way. Kamesa is the first to eat. We had to cut a piece there and, 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 and your hand doesn't want to put it into your mouth and your mouth doesn't want to open and you feel so miserable you feel so like nothing i mean why god is sending us this horrible test i was feel so depressed and so miserable in that moment let me tell you this one of the worst the worst moments in my life how long does it take the human mind to accommodate this and to think no it's okay I don't know, maybe four, five, six days. It's a battle between your starving and your body is asking you for food and, and your revulsion. We had made a pact before we died that if we died, our bodies should be used by your friends because there's nothing uh, more beautiful in life than to give your life for your friends. It is decided that the bodies of relatives will be left alone. And if they ever get out of here, they agree, no one will tell who is eaten and who is not. Canessa and Parado are among the tough pragmatists. They will do what must be done. You haven't eaten anything for 10 days, 11 days. You are young. You have friends. What should you do? Commit a massive suicide with your friends? From the very first, Parado never believed they would be rescued. And on the tenth day, with its bone-numbing cold, comes confirmation of what they have feared in their hearts. The search for the Uruguayan aircraft has been called off because of negative results, went the radio report. The Chilean forces would look for the bodies in the spring. Now, utter gloom and the knowledge that no one can save them but themselves. Life on the mountain falls into a brutal routine. Some take meat from the dead. Others spend the day melting snow for water. One of them finds a camera and takes these photographs, a few scavenged clothing from the luggage. Others are nearly catatonic, paralyzed by fear, cold, and hunger. At night, they tell their stories and pray for comfort. We were trapped in the Andes. We didn't know where we were. With very low temperatures, no food, completely doomed. The rescue had been called off, so we were in a very bad situation. How can that turn worse? They'll soon find out, as they learn just how unforgiving this alien world can become. Fewer food supplies, the flesh has been eaten, and still, and the rescue has been called off. When we come back, we're going to take, we're going to take you inside that plane as the story picks up from there. Could they still survive with little supplies? Stay with us. 28 survivors have survived that plane crash. A few of the boys, had, a few of the men had decided not to eat the flesh till they die. But they had to keep on going because they were starving. The temperatures were dropping and few actual supplies left. So the question is, what more could be done to do this? We're not going to take you inside the plane as the story picks up. So here again... Keith Morrison. 
There are forces in these mountains, immense and frightening, that go far beyond human scale. Old hands of the Andes trying to explain the scope of nature's power say simply, God lives here. But in a broken, stinking metal coffin, God seems noticeably absent. At 4.30 on the afternoon of October 29th, their 17th day on the mountain, the 27 survivors crawled into their damaged fuselage to take shelter from the cold. Outside, the sun dipped behind the nearest peak of the temperature plunge. Inside, they arranged themselves like sardines, head to foot, pressed close side to side for warmth. There was a lingering, frigid twilight. Silence descended. No one had any sign. No one had a premonition of a new disaster. I never heard it coming. It's a huge avalanche. Before anyone can react, even take a breath, it engulfs the fuselage. Tons of snow sweep through the open tail. It swallows all within. In a second, it packs in hard. I couldn't move, absolutely. Not one finger, one arm, nothing. I couldn't move. I was completely covered by maybe two or three feet of snow, but packed snow. I know, it was like concrete. They have survived disaster and fear and torment. They've survived on the flesh of dead friends. For what? To be buried alive. But some will not be allowed even the peace of the dead. One teammate has somehow escaped the avalanche, and he frantically tears at the snow and uncovers Kanasa. I begin to dig for my friends that were nearby, but they were almost all dead. Despite their heroic struggles, death comes again to the mountain. Eight more lives snuffed out. Then a second avalanche rolls over the plain. The fuselage is now totally buried. The boys trapped inside. The Fairchild is now an icy grave. The survivors and bodies share a space less than three feet high between the snow and the ceiling of the aircraft. On top of the plane are at least three more feet of heavy snow. But even buried alive, they come up with a plan to get to the cockpit and escape. So we start to dig uh, like a rabbit, a tunnel through the snow so that we could get out. For three days and nights, they dig through their frozen tomb. They work by the flickering flames of their cigarette lighters. There is so little oxygen, the flames fade. The fuselage, instead of being our home, was a, a death trap. Hunger weakens them. They're forced to feed on one of the victims of the avalanche. A blizzard rages above them. Finally, they tunnel their way to a landscape that is utterly changed. The plane and the bodies that had kept them alive are lost beneath the drifts. Nineteen still live. Three suffer life-threatening wounds. They have been here 20 days. Every survivor has lost a close friend or family member. They are profoundly depressed because now to their fear of starving or freezing to death is added the constant threat of being buried alive. We were so afraid that uh, it was a physical fear that you felt in your stomach. And the courage came from the fear and from the will to see your family again. And yet, in a few of them, the courage somehow wells up and takes over. The strong look after the weak. But several of them are still in agony over what they must eat. Their friends force them to consume what they must to live. I had great difficulties in swallowing. I rejected it. I can't say it was because of the flavor, because it didn't have any flavor. It was all frozen. But it cost me a lot of effort. And my friends forced me to eat. They forced me to keep myself alive. Every day, by agreement, each boy is allotted about a half pound of the human remains, just enough to survive. Once a week, they use some flammable bit of airplane to build a fire. Otherwise, everything is raw or sun-dried on the roof of the plane. You cannot imagine what that was like. Being there and seeing the deterioration of your friends who were alive, they were like living cadavers. They decide they have one hope of rescue, repair the cockpit radio transmitter, but they know the batteries that powered it are somewhere down the mountain, in the missing tail section. In late November, several of them stagger down the mountain to the tail. They find the batteries and improvise an antenna. It fails to work. All hope lost. The enormity of their failure evidenced by their faces in this photo they take. 
and they find six more bodies. For all that, they very nearly freeze to death at night. Now it's obvious they're far too weak and ill-prepared to walk from their mountain prison. And by the time they struggle back to the Fairchild, another friend has died from an infected leg. No radio, no hope of discovery. From 46, they're down to 17. The mood shifts from despondency to despair. It's now been six weeks since their crash. In the isolated little society of the Fairchild, there were certainties. They knew the search for them was long over. They knew that one by one they would continue to die. They knew that all their days were numbered. They knew that if there was a chance for any of them to survive, they would have to send someone out for help. But who had the strength to go? And when? And in what direction? There is no question Parada will go. Since the first week on the mountain, he's been a man obsessed. Canessa is still strong, strong enough to go, but he thinks they should wait until later in the spring. But too many are starving. His teammates compel him. So, decision made, the expeditioners become a cast apart. Extra rations, the warmest place to sleep, all to strengthen them for their journey. The engineering student designs equipment for the trip. Sun goggles made with glass from the windshield and straps from the seat backs. It is the start of South American spring. As they prepare for the expedition, the boys bask in the sun of the day. But the warmth brings both opportunities and threats. Even with the additional bodies from the tail, they are running out of food. Nothing is going to waste. Everything but the skin, heads and genitals eaten. This became normal. And you don't think that you are eating human flesh. This is only energy. The mind works to help you, not to push you in a bad situation. So you forget that these are your friends and you only are eating energy. Despite the strengthening sun of the day, at this altitude, nights are still frigid. By now, all talk of food or home or girlfriends is forbidden. It's just too depressing. At night, they say the rosary and pray for the success of the expedition. Their thoughts turn to death, their questions to God. Why do my friends have to die? Why does he make me suffer like this? Why do I have to go through this degradation, this brutal humiliation, which was to eat your friends? Christmas comes with the spring in South America. We heard a lot of jingle bells, jingle bells, and it was the most desperate, unnerving thing. Christmas was coming, bringing pain and anxiety. Koche, who is having more and more trouble eating, decides he cannot face Christmas on the mountain. He stops eating entirely and prepares to die. It was a lot easier to die than to continue doing those things to keep yourself alive. When you want to die, it was very simple. The only difference between Koche and the others is that he is starving of his own will. If Canessa and Parado fail, they're all going to die. So the question is, will these survive or will they give up and die? When we come back, the answer to the question, the, an the question will be answered as well as the other question. Will they make it to Chile? The Green Valleys of Chile. Stay with us. Well, we are now at a time. We're going to continue this on Monday. Will Coche and the others survive this trip across the Andes? Will they make it to Chile? Or will they, get, or will they give up? Not eat the human flesh. Not eat the human flesh. Not eat the food that's from bank because the low on supplies. And not stay warm. That's all we're going to cover tomorrow. Also coming up tomorrow, the fresh hazards. We're going to talk about E. coli. Maybe in the wrong hamburger. What about well, what about the fruits and vegetables? That's also coming up on Monday. So you do not want to miss the conclusion. You don't want to miss this story. I've watched it several times, and believe me, I was stunned when I heard about this story. So, Keith Morrison will continue the alive story. On Monday. That's giving break for the Saturday going to Sunday. 
We'll see you again for Game Break Monday. For all of us here at YouTube and Give Me a Break, I hope you've had a great day for all of us here at Give Me a Break and YouTube. Good night, everyone.